Hello everybody, today we'll talk about why JSON schema doesn't always do what you think maybe it should be doing. And with us to talk about this is um, Henry Andrews, co-author of the JSON schema spec for the last five years. Um, hey Henry, thanks for joining, on, how are you fast. doing? Good, good, thank you for having me on. Yeah, yeah, JSON schema has been a kind of an ongoing process. So yes, there's been a couple of drafts over the years here as everyone knows. So yeah, uh, I wanted to, really highlight how, particularly for someone who is used to modeling data in a strictly typed language, such as Java, um, JSON schema often defies expectations. Uh, and so, you know, we'll, we'll have people showing up on the JSON schema Slack going, why is this happening? Why, you know, I set up my object and then it said that this integer was valid. You know, why did that, why, but this is an object, I've defined properties. And really, you know, when you start with an empty Java class with no data members, you can't put any data in it by definition. So it, it, it holds no data. Um, if you start off with an empty JSON schema, uh, it allows everything. Any data that you hand to that and say, is this valid? It's going to say, yeah, sure, fine. I and think this already answers mindset. the questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Our initial question like, why does it allow so many things? It's like, well, because you have to disallow things. You, you have but to disallow. I really like the way how you think about it, you know, in terms of the differences of programming languages, right? Like how strictly, I think people working in a certain flavor of programming language sometimes are not quite aware of how it shapes the way they expect yes. the world to function. And then you you get both of them, right? Right, right. You get, you get people, space. yeah, you get people coming in from Perl where it's like, oh, you mean this thing could be, class could be either an object or an integer? Yeah, sure, Perl's fine with that, <laughs> right? So like, in that case, yes, it's very great that JSON schema will let you define properties, but also consider an integer valid at the same time. Um, but if you're coming from something like Java, that's not a thing that happens. I mean, maybe you can do it if you work really hard. I'm not even sure. But um, but that's not how that's not how Java works. That's not how you think about data modeling in Java typically. So when you switch over to JSON schema and you're trying to write a JSON schema that matches this Java class that you have that has certain data members that are, you know, whether they're, they're, they're numbers and strings or whether they're other, you know, instances of classes that are themselves objects with other properties, you need to find the JSON schema that's going to validate the same set of data that, that fits in your Java class as, as close as, as is reasonable, given that these are not quite the same thing. So with the JSON schema, like you really want to think about this as starting at two different points. Like if you start with your, your empty Java class and your empty JSON schema, one of them's all the way at the allow everything and the other's at the other all the way in the, at, the, at the hold nothing. So you it's need to add things. It's a good way to think about it, it, right? There's hmm? two sides of the spectrum. Good yeah, way to yeah. think about it. You know, two sides of the spectrum. It's like very permissive and very prohibitive. And then very like prohibitive. And you yeah. need to tell the prohibitive one, okay, allow this, allow this. I'm going to define it. I'm going to define this data member. It's going to be of this type. I'm going to define this data member. It's going to be a, you know, a reference to this, to an instance of this class. And that builds up more things that that one will permit. And then from the JSON schema side, you have to say, okay, I don't, this, this is an object. So I actually have to say that it's an object and exclude integers and arrays and everything. And it has these properties, but like, if I just define the properties, that wouldn't, exclude it from being some other type. You have to use the type keyword to exclude the, the types and say, okay, this is a type object, it's not anything else. And then when you define your properties, you're saying, okay, objects with this property are valid and specifically objects where this property is of type integer are valid. Objects that have this property but don't have that type are not valid. But that doesn't necessarily mean that objects that don't have that property are valid. You have to say required, and you have to say that that specific property is required. So you have to exclude all the objects that don't have that property. Um, and then this, you have to keep doing this by layering things on. You know, whereas like in Java, again, once you say, okay, I have a property and it's an integer, then like you've got that, and maybe you can assign null to it. You know, maybe it can be initialized as null, but if you actually set it as an int, then it's going to by default be initialized as zero. Right. Um, so like you have to actually think of all those things. And if you if you want if you want a default value in there, you're going to have to specify that default value. Um, and uh, so, yeah, you have so, to keep excluding all these different things until you get to the same but, thing that that definition just said. Yes, this is. 
But it's interesting, you know, like you're saying, like this is this process of, you know, like getting these two sides basically to kind of get together. But one thing I'm wondering about is like, how do you know when you're done, you know, with yeah. adding these constraints? Because I think in the end, right there, the, you could think at least theoretically, right? There always could be more constraints. I could be adding to my schema. Am I forgetting some that might bite me? later on, like what would your recommendation be as a, as a way to figure out, am I done with adding those constraints? Yeah, yeah. And really with JSON schema, the fundamental thing for validation is you want to think about the structure of your data. Um, mm -hmm. So you want to think about things like types. You want to think about, OK, which things are objects and arrays, and how are they arranged with each other? Uh, and you want to think about you know, kind of basic constraints on that shape, like the range of, of numbers or the length of strings, or you know, how, how many items can I have in this array? Those sorts of things are all JSON schema does great at that. Um, now, you can keep trying to do more things. There are additional things that can be done in standard JSON schema, and then there are extensions, which we're not talking about today. But you, you know, once you start getting into code, you can make it do anything if you really, really, really want to. The question is, should you, right? Um, and that's where things definitely, you know, once you start getting into more semantic or detailed things, it's like, okay, I have a string, but I have complex constraints on what the contents of the strings are. Well, okay, if you have, a, if you can do it with a regular expression, we have a regular expression keyword, fine. But if it's something more, more complex that requires like application knowledge, you're going to start getting more and more, it's going to be more and more difficult to encode that in JSON schema. Um, and keywords that have attempted to do that, like format, tend to be a little inconsistent in how well they're supported. Um, so really, this is where JSON schema annotations come in that help you find things in the data. And that lets your application say, OK, well, I found this piece that should be, I don't know, an email to one of these domains. Now your application can do the rest of that validation that is you know, more focused on, on kind of how you're using things or what the meaning is in the context of that application. So in that case, your JSON schema kind of becomes part of a bigger validation context, right? Yeah. Where it's like your first, first step, plus it does some initial analysis, and then it hands it over to later stages that then can do additional things, yeah. um, including all the kinds of, I don't know, back, back in the good old XML days, right? There was. These examples, like you said, write regular expressions. OK, maybe we can do that. And then there's like all the things all the way down to, well, I have to check whether this field contains a value that I have in that database. And it's like, well, yeah. that's kind of hard to do for a validation language. Yeah, yeah. And, and a, a really great example is um, uh, in APIs and where you have, you know, you have things in request and response, and it could be read only or write only. And what does that mean? And should this be valid in this context or not, right? JSON schema doesn't know if this is this is a put request or a get response or a post request to create something or whatever else. Uh, but you can you can you can put some information, right? JSON schema has read only and write only keywords, but they're not validation keywords; they're annotation keywords. So in the more recent versions of JSON schema, you can do your validation. You can look at the annotation output, and you can figure out, oh, this is a read-only field. And you can be like, OK, well, this is a put, and I'm validating it on the server. And I can tell that you tried to change a read-only field with a put. So I'm going to say, no, that's not valid. So JSON mm -hmm. schema didn't figure out that, that this was an invalid thing in, to, you know, to write, because it doesn't know that you're writing. It just knows that you have data. But then it can it can let you know that like okay someone wrote the schema and said that this was read only and then your other piece of code can say okay I know that this is a write and you try to change this so it's invalid and that's a good handoff between JSON schema and another part of your system. That's a really nice. I think you know it's like this is almost so interesting. It's it's a good segue for another video. Indeed, uh, indeed. But, right because now I, I think we started with okay JSON schema doesn't quite do what I wanted to do and then you explain you know how to fix that in, at least in the sense that you look at the shape of your data and you make sure that at least you validate everything that you need to validate on that part. And forget then everything this, else. Like, forget everything else, yeah. But you then also handing everything. it over to an application, right? That's, I think, another interesting part. But I think that's really something we should leave for another yes. video. But I really like it because I think this idea of 
treating validation as a pipeline and not as, you know, there's only one step which has to do everything allows you also to just do it in much more modular ways, right? And say, yes. here's my grammar part, here's my application logic part, and then I think you, you end up with better code in the end. You, you do, and, you, and you, you've really focused on that structure of the data and, you know, in the API context that you're sending back and forth. And then you don't encode the things that are specific to like, oh, your client application code and your server application code are going to care about different things, you know, after that. So if you've modularized mm -hmm. that, then you can, you can validate those things differently um, in those different contexts if, if, if that's what you're doing. So mm -hmm. yeah, really like thinking about that structure and like getting that shape down, excluding all of the things that you don't want from the shape, remembering that unlike your strictly typed language, the JSON schema is not going to assume that you, that you only want the things that you said. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's going to say, okay, if those things are there, that's great that you pass. If these other things are there, oh, I don't know about them. They're fine. Sure, whatever. No, no, no. You have to tell it, nope, nope, I don't want those. So just remember to exclude everything that you don't want and you'll, you'll get that convergence to the same data model. I think that's a great wrap up. So our, our initial question was, how, why does my JSON schema allow so many things? And I think the, the short answer is add more constraints yep, and then you'll be fine. Okay. Henry, thanks so much for joining. This was really informative. I, I hope this will um, help people to better understand JSON schema, how to use it well. And I also hope that we'll have the opportunity to talk more about, you know, this idea of JSON validation, JSON schema validation pipelines, because I yes. think that sounds really intriguing to me. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's a great, it's a great topic. I'd love to explore it further. Thanks for having me on. I would definitely love to be back. Okay, so I'll I'll hold you up to that. And with that, we're done for today. Thanks everybody for watching. I hope you found it interesting. If you did, give it a thumbs up. And until next time, keep getting APIs to work and all the best. Bye.